phone. So on your phone, if you don't want to see them, you click more um, yeah. and it will bring it up. You'll bring up, you'll bring up more um, menu items and one of them will be to hide the closed captions. All right, let me look and see. It says chat, view full transcript and meeting settings. Transcript? Yeah, okay. Do you see hide? Anything in there hide? No, I'm looking, let me know. No, I don't see anything hide. Um, well, I'll help you. You know what I'll do um, during the, I'm going to chat it to you. Once we get this started, I'll do it. I'll, I'll sign on with my phone and see what the options are for that. All right. Uh, well, it's okay. I, I'm okay. Let me see if I can get back in now. I, what do I do? Just click? I yeah, know. just tap back on onto the screen. All right. I'm trying. It doesn't go back. I'll wait for you. Oh, no. <laughs> it doesn't go back. Well, I, if you're on your phone, just go back to that app. Oh, okay. I'll... I'll just have to go back. Okay, I'm going to, you tell me, we're gonna wait for you, Rob. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. All I'm... right, and Steve, are you ready once we introduce you? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, let me make you a co-host before I forget. Steve. All right. So first of all, welcome back. I hope everyone's enjoying their evening and I should say uh, weekend, not evening. And I am very uh, excited to watch this presentation. We've had the great pleasure and honor of watching a number, and, and I shouldn't say watching, but seeing a lot of the travels from Steve and Arlene. And today will be no different. Today we're going to be watching and viewing a presentation by Steve Myrer that will include his travels to Africa. And as he titled it, Searching for the Big Five, or, or really the search of the Big Five. And as if you read today's presentation um, email, what that means is there are five big um, game animals that part of the Africa tour included searching for those. So we're going to introduce Steve and let him share the presentation. And of course, as we've done in the past, if you do have any questions, all of the slides are numbered and you are welcome to remember that slide and come back to it later during the Q&A. <clears throat> so I'm going to spotlight Steve. And uh, thank you, Steve. Okay, and you can see my uh, beginning slide, that's okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Levy. I'd like to uh, welcome all my friends and relatives, my both my brother's family and my sister's family are on, as well as my co-traveler, Arlene. So this uh, journey began in December of 1997 when Arlene and I journeyed to South Africa to attend the wedding of the daughter of Neely and Kathy Gosai, who Arlene had previously met in Malaysia in 1990. When the Gosai's visited us in Schenectady, New York a few years later, we promised to visit South Africa when their daughter Ashara got married and the time had finally arrived. Our 33 day trip to East Africa covered, in addition to South Africa, it covered Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, and Kenya. So we covered a good chunk of Africa in our uh, month. We were met at the Durban airport by Neely and Kathy and their friend Harry, Harry Karen, who had also visited us in Schenectady and transported to their house in Pungat Township, located in the province of KwaZulu, Nepal. This township was established for people of Indian descent during apartheid, whose ancestors came to South Africa to work in the sugar refining industry as indentured laborers. The house was surrounded by a gated wall with a large tent on the front lawn for the wedding festivities. So this is Durban. <clears throat> It's located uh, on the east coast of Africa on a bay that flows into the Indian Ocean. And these are all Durban uh, seaside scenes.
we also visited the Sharks Board. Um, they um, do research on sharks, they dissect sharks, and they have a lot of exhibits and, and they specialize in that. This is uh, the Gosai's house in Tonga. As you can see, it's a pretty modern dwelling. And in the foreground, what you can see is the large tent. And this is our friend Harry's house, who lives in an adjoining, adjoining community. And this is our friend Harry. That's the school he was principal of, called the Phoenix School in Kwasi Natal. Uh, at that time, well, apartheid had ended a few years prior to that, but there were basically the black population with their own schools, the white population, and then the Indian population, which had their own school system. And Harry was a principal of this school. We were immediately made to feel a part of the family and got a I got to play a role in some of the ceremonies involved with the multi-day Hindu wedding. There was a visit to the home of the groom's parents where we presented gifts as part of the bride's family. And there was also a ceremony in the front lawn tent in which we took part. The wedding and reception was held in the community center in Pungat with 700 guests in attendance. With the wedding out of the way, we did some local sightseeing in and around Durban. One of the highlights was going to a village and observing how the people live. We also saw a Zulu dance, dance performance featuring bare-breasted women and a Zulu king. Arlen got to sit on the king's lap and he wanted to marry her, but I didn't have the dowry of 10 carats. So this is the, the Zulu village that we visited. This is the kind of dwellings that they lived in. As you can see, it's pretty primitive. This is the high school for the village. This is Arlene with some of the locals. This is the king and Arlene. She could have been queen. These are some of the performers. And after we let, left the village, we traveled around that part of uh, South Africa. Wazulu Natal is mostly inhabited by Zulu members and members of the Zulu tribe, and there's also a concentration of Indians. Farm of alligator and crocodile. Uh, we passed by Glide River Canyon, which 
one of the largest canyons in the world and the greenest. So that's a major attraction. Then the Oyakapi drove us to Cougar National Park in northeastern South Africa. Our plan was to spend a week each in Tanzania and Kenya on safari so as to be sure to see the big five African animals, lions, elephants, Cape buffalo, leopards, and rhinoceroses. This plan was shot on the first day in Kruger when Kathy drove us around the park and we saw all of the big five. So these are our pictures of the animals we saw in Kruger Park. Kruger is actually a civilized place to see animals because the roads that you drive on in your own vehicle are paved. Whereas our experiences in the other countries were not, uh, not as civilized, but we're going on primitive trails and walking to the bush. And animals come up pretty close to the car because they're not afraid of vehicles. As long as you stay in the car, you're safe. I learned that the giraffes, giraffes have different variations. These are reticulated giraffes. The very the spots are different on the various kinds. This is a Maasai giraffe. These uh, lumps floating in the water, uh, hippopotami. That's the bird. It's a hyena nursing her young. There's, these are a bunch of dung beetles rolling a, a dung pile down the road. I'm, I'm not sure what they do with it, but that was pretty interesting. Wildebeest. This is a snake eagle. Uh, this is a snake that it had actually caught and uh, was preparing to eat, I guess. Um, when we were in the park, we stayed in a circular multi-room hut and prepared our own meals. Kathy introduced me to fried potato and ketchup sandwiches, which were filling and tasty. On the way back to Tungat, we made a stop in Pretoria, which is the seat of the executive branch of government. So this is the uh, Eastern Transvaal, which is the the province around which the park is located. The vegetable market, fruit market. And the car wash. These folks were selling crafts. That's a captain on the right and all and on the left. And this is Neely and Kathy. This 
We also visited the uh, De Beer diamond mine. It's now called, I believe, the Cullinan mine. It's located in the, the town of Cullinan. They didn't give us free samples, unfortunately. And this is the Pretoria, the Union Building. It's where uh, the executive branch uh, hangs out. And that's where the president of uh, South Africa was on. This is the War Trekker Monument. Um, this commemorated an 1835 trek of the uh, descendants of the original Dutch who moved from the southern part of South Africa, which is now Cape Town, up to the northeast part of the country because they were, uh, didn't want to hang out with the British who had moved into southern South Africa. And uh, they fought a war at some point, the Boer War, that the British won. We also spent a night at Harry's family home in Burlum, also an Indian township. Harry took us to the school where he was the principal and introduced us, introduced us to his woman friend who owned the dry cleaning business who prepared dinner. Harry told us that he once found a black mambo snake under his car, which was news we could have done without. Our South African stay was now interrupted by our visits to Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tanzania, and Kenya. We arrived in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe during Christmas week of 1997 to stay in the 32 room Lala Lodge, bordering on a private game preserve. Before we left home, we were told that Africa was a great place to trade t shirts and jeans for local crafts. We came well supplied for major trading, but didn't meet with great success. The women were interested in selling their goods for money so that they could buy food for their families. They told us that clothing wasn't a very useful trading tool because American relief organizations were shipping tons of the stuff, which was distributed for free. We were able to get some carved animals for t-shirts. And we found a guy selling a scrimshawed walk hard tusk and ostrich egg for a pair of my worn out Jeffrey Dean jeans, some t shirts, and $30. We negotiated the trade. Victoria Falls is home to the famous falls, which are the largest in the world and considered to be one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Unfortunately, it hadn't rained in Victoria Falls in a long time, and the falls were greatly reduced. The good news was that we were able to get a clear view of the falls, which are ordinarily obscured by a heavy mist. So these are various views of Victoria Falls and the river above it where the falls generated. The mongoose, storks. Uh, this is a view from our room in the Alala Lodge. There are 32 rooms, each having a view of the private game preserve. One evening, <coughs> Um, this part of the stay, whenever you go to anywhere in Africa, they take you out in jeeps to look uh, for game. And this is the view from the front window of the jeep we were in. This is a traffic jam in Zimbabwe. These are some of the local folks.
This is one of the carvers uh, getting preparing material to carve. And these are some folks at Victoria Falls. One evening, we took a wine and cheese canoe ride on the Zambezi River. Uh, the guide was careful not to steer too close to large mounds visible above the water. He explained that they were hippos who were territorial. We later found out that the hippos can capsize the canoe, at which point the crocodiles in the river finish you off. So this is uh, the canoe ride. And from the Zambezi River on the other side of Zambia. So this is the view of Zambia. The Zambezi River is the border between Zimbabwe and Zambia. These are some of the hippos. And these are some of the guys that uh, manned the canoes. On Christmas Day, we heard that 16 rooms out of the 32 were vacant because the group coming from another part of Africa was stranded by flooding. Victoria Falls could have used some of the precipitation. Since the hotel was half, half empty in a holiday, we were able to have breakfast with the hotel's assistant manager, Felicity McDonald. Arlene, as she is prone to do, promptly started talking about India and told Felicity that she was one third Jewish, one third Hindu, and one third Muslim to explain her multiculturalism. Felicity promptly responded that she was Jewish and her maiden name was Fega Morgenstern. Her family had left Germany and gone to Israel and then to Rhodesia. Felicity married a farmer and had a nine-year-old daughter. Some years before, when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and anarchy replaced the law of the land, Felicity was attacked at home by blacks, raped, and brutally beaten. She spent months in the hospital recovering. Victoria Falls is located on the border with Zambia, which can be reached by walking over a bridge spanning the Zambezi River. Naturally, we had to do that. In route, we watched foolhardy tourists bungee jumping from the bridge. There was one guy on duty to attach the harness to the jumper and another to push the jumper when he or she lost their nerve. But we passed on the opportunity. So here is a uh, bungee jumper hanging over the river. When we reached the border, we had to buy Zambian visas for $20 each. We had been told that there would be taxis available as soon as we crossed the border, but that turned out not to be the case. We wound up walking a fair distance until we came to some taxis, most of which looked like they would not be capable of traveling very far. And then a red Dodge appeared that seemed to be in reasonable condition. Only negotiated a rate of $20 for two hours of sightseeing. As we started off, I realized that the engine in this taxi wasn't much better than any of the other wrecks that we had seen. After a short time, Only came to the conclusion that there was nothing worthwhile to be seen in Livingston, Zambia. All around was squalor, so we got the driver to take us back to the border crossing. So much for Zambia, although we got a view of Victoria Falls from the Zambian side. So this is the border crossing. Zambian flag. This is the only picture I took in Zambia. It was so memorable. When we got to the airport to fly from Victoria Falls to Tanzania, we discovered that the air traffic controllers were on strike and no one was sure when the plane would arrive. We had to make a connecting flight from Harare, Zimbabwe to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So this was per pretty nerve wracking. The plane finally showed up and since we were so late, 
who allowed to keep all those that you have us in the cabin. At Harare, we were met by a tractor, which was normally used for pulling luggage carts. We were loaded on the tractor and whisked to our connecting flight just in the nick of time. In Tanzania, we were met by Isaac with this ancient, ancient Land Rover, who would be our driver, naturalist, and tour guide for the next week. For most of the week, we stayed in two tented camps owned by a white couple which were large furnished tents with the bed enclosed and mosquito netting. The roof of the bathroom area, however, was not completely enclosed, which resulted in mosquito bites in inappropriate places. Within it, in days, Roman was covered with mosquito bites. They also were in an open dining area and considering the primitive surroundings was surprisingly good. So this is uh, Tanzania. These are Maasai who inhabit Tanzania. Uh, they all pretty much wear these red plaid or plain red blankets and walk around with these big sticks for protection. And in the back, you can see the herd of cattle. So that's their whole life, herding cattle. This, I believe, is an anthill. Uh, Tanzania has the Serengeti Park, which it occupies a large part of the country, and that's where all the game is. So that's where we spent our week. That's an eagle, I think. And this is a Rothschild giraffe, another variety. The jackal. These are uh, some Maasai that they are herd of cattle. There are many kinds of antelopes. This one is called the dick dick. <clears throat> On our second day, we visited the village of the Maasai man who is the night watchman for the tented camp. The village consisted of a number of huts occupied by the village chief and his numerous wives, children, and cattle. Marlene was presented with a beaded Maasai necklace, and she in turn gave out lipsticks and ballpoint pens. When it was time to leave, we were told by Isaac that the necklace was $20. Marlene immediately returned it and tried to retrieve the gifts that she had bestowed. I don't think she got many of them back, and we do the hasty retreat. And this is the Maasai village. And they all live in these thatched huts. Thatched huts. And there's all in taking pictures. That's Isaac's land rover jeep. And I think all in is in the center of this gathering. Only must have felt bad about not getting a Maasai necklace because I was, as we were passing the Maasai Boma the next day, we made Isaac stop the Jeep. I waited in the Jeep as they went into the enclosure to purchase something. After a while, I emerged as, merged with Arlen proudly sporting a necklace and some bracelets. In our travels, we saw many Maasai herders clad in traditional red pattern, pattern cloth walking with their flocks. Their only protection from wild animals was a stout stick that they carried. We also got to visit a shaman for a $20 admission fee. Molly thought that she was going to get her fortune told 
but that would have cost an additional $50. The witch doctor was not a Maasai, but lived in a similar village with thatch huts occupied by his wives and various offspring. For our admission fee, Arlen got to chat with him and he showed me his medicine kit, which he took from his clinic hut, consisting of some animal bones and herbs. So this is the, uh, the Sangoma, the uh, medicine man. Oops. And that's Wayne, and that's uh, our driver, Isaac. And this is the, this is actually the compound that the uh, medicine man had, the Sangoma had with his family. I think he had a separate heart for each of his wives. He also had a car, but I don't know if he could drive it. <laughs> and this is uh, all in getting some medical advice or something. These are views of the Serengeti. The roads here were not paved. This is a, a, a town, Mutuwa Mabu, and their central market. And you can see um, there was some rain, so there were a lot of puddles. New Year's Eve 1998 was spent at the Sofa Lodge in the Gora Gora Crater. The hotel had a New Year's Eve party with traditional native costumes supplied by pretty young hostesses. I got wrapped in some colorful sheets and to provide me with an edge in the costume contest, Arlene draped her Maasai necklace around my neck. She discovered that it stunk from cattle urine, which must have been an integral component of its manufacture. When we got home, she sold it in a, at a garage sale. Needless to say, my native splendor netted me second place in the contest, and I was awarded a sofa lodge cap and t shirt. Another highlight of the trip was a visit to the Oduvai Gorge, considered the cradle of mankind. It was at this prehistoric site that the Leakey family discovered fossil bones and artifacts of early man. There was a small museum at the site which featured their discoveries. So this is a view of the crater. Uh, this is a herd, and there's a Maasai herder here on the left. This is a view from the lodge, beautiful sunset. This is Old Dubai, where the Leakey's family, Leakey family discovered prehistoric artifacts of man. Of course, throughout the trip, we saw many animals in the wild. They were especially plentiful in the Serengeti National Park, where wildebeest and zebra migrate to the Masamara National Reserve in Kenya in July and make the return trip in November. In addition to the big five, we saw cheetahs, gazelles, topaz, elan, waterbuck, hyenas, baboons, and polys, giraffes, and many species of birds. <clears throat> Isaac told us that when we first started the trip that his wife was expecting their third child sometime during a week on the road. His sons were named Abraham and Jacob, and he was planning to continue his biblical meaning pattern. When he deposited us at the airport in Dar es Salaam for our flight to Nairobi, Kenya, he didn't know whether or not he had, begun, he had again become a father. <clears throat> This is a <clears throat> this is a Maasai boma, and <clears throat> the cattle they keep inside. I, I guess they also um, 
the attainment of some vegetation. And this is a vulture, water beast. These are impalas and wilder beasts, Stork, storks, <clears throat> cheetahs, that's uh, a mother and two cubs. Cheetahs uh, go, go right up to uh, the jeeps. So leopard. These are birds. The forest. The papadamai. These are more birds. The lion family. These uh, all look like females. The female. This is another boma. <clears throat> this must be some tourists stopping by to buy uh, jewelry. These are male lions. They uh, sleep 20 hours a day. They let the uh, females do all the work while they're hunting and taking care of the young. I think that's a male and a female. A male. These are birds. Here are the beasts. So, as you can see, plenty of uh, photo opportunities. and beautiful countryside. I guess these guys are at my side because they don't have their blankets on. This is a village or a town actually. As you can see, even in towns, the roads are not okay and pretty muddy. The leopard family and the uh, another leopard at the bottom line. That's the male lion. Sunset in Tanzania. This is the uh, <clears throat> town of Arusha. Near the streets are paved because you can see a, a line down the street, and there are even street signs.
<clears throat> this is an unplayed state. And this is the border between Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, <clears throat> upon arrival in Nairobi, Kenya, we were met by the tour operator who arranged the Kenya portion of our trip. He seemed somewhat haggard and explained that he had been up all night guarding his house with a machete from invaders who had broken down his front door. His home security service didn't send any help until the following morning. Kenya was more advanced in tourism than Tanzania, so we didn't have to stay in tented camps. It was also a lot more scary, especially in Nairobi. Our hotel in Nairobi was two blocks from the restaurant, visible from the hotel, which was recommended to us. We were advised not to walk alone, and taxi fares appeared to be too high, so we hired a guard from the hotel to walk with us. He offered me one of his sticks as protection, but Arlen told him that I'd probably run away if we were requested. Returning from the hotel, we took a taxi. While in the Roby, we visited the former house and coffee plantation of Danish author Karen Blixen. The plantation was a failure, but it had some interesting artifacts. And it provided Blixen with the material for her book, Out of Africa. She spent 17 years in Africa. And this is uh, Nairobi, Kenya, the capital of Kenya. This is Carolyn Blixen's house in her coffee plantation. This is some machinery left over from her plantation days. In Kenya, we didn't have a dedicated driver as we did in Tanzania but were transported to our various hotels, but no tent camps, by land or, or bus. The first stop was the Ark Lodge, located in the Abidari's National Park. The lodge was sited next to a watering hole, which was baited with salt blocks to attract animals and illuminated with front floodlights for night, night viewing. Each room was equipped with a buzzer which would have summoned guests to the observation deck when animals showed up during the night. The floodlights also attracted so many moths that visibility was difficult. Needless to say, we didn't get much sleep that night. So these are again, Masamara camera scenes. The female lion. This is a, a fearless cheater. They, they like to, to get up on heights so that you view a potential hunting victims. Now these must have been tame rhinoceros. Um, because you wouldn't get close to an untamed animal. That's a male and a female. They spent four days mating, so I guess they just got done. The vultures feast, feasting on the remains of the kill. 
This is a view from the hotel we stand at, the Ark. This is the watering hole, which attracted uh, wildebeest. And birds as well. Next was the Mount Kenya Safari Club with cloud shrouded views of Mount Kenya in the distance, co founded by the actor William Holden. Only wanted to stay in the room that he used when he was a guest there, but it would have cost an additional $700. He found out that Holden's girlfriend, the actress Stephanie Powers, had a house nearby. So we borrowed a golf cart to check it out. We found the house surrounded by hedges and a gate that didn't try to visit. This is the grounds of the Mount Kenya Safari Club on in the foreground. And this is me with a view of Mount Kenya, cloud shrouded in the background. Leaving the safari club, we passed a collection of souvenir shops that claimed to be located on the equator, featuring two sinks, one on each side of the hemisphere divide. Water poured into the sink in the northern hemisphere and spun in one direction, and the sink in the other hemisphere, the water spun in the other direction. This dif difference was actually caused by slight differences in the shape of the sink rather than by their yeah, hemisphere location. My safari hat, actually a green green hat, was much admired by the local males, and I had been approached several times with trade offers, which I resisted. The hat had taken a beating from being crushed and from sweat, and I was under pressure from all in to get rid of it. So when I was again approached at the equator, I swapped it for some wooden figures. And this is us at the equator. I still had my hat at that point. Longin had, al had always been interested in Jane Goodall's work with chimpanzees. So we next stayed at a property in the Sweetwater's Game Reserve and included a visit to get Jane Goodall's Institute in Gandhi as an optional activity. When we got to the hotel, we were told that we would not be able to get there because heavy rains had flooded the roads. Only had to content herself with a visit to an animal orphanage at the hotel that had monkeys. Our substitute optional activity was a camel ride. So these are some of the animals we saw at Sweetwater's. And you can see that there was heavy flooding. Now, this is in the, in the animal orphanage, actually, where you can get close to the animal. And this is the camel that I wrote on. And Driving past the Equator souvenir shops on the way to the airport, I saw my safari hat being proudly worn by its new owner. To get to our next destination, a hotel in the Kenya bush, we flew in a single engine four seat plane. It was a white knuckle flight, but I found it exciting to see herds of animals in the great rift valley below. The landing strip at the hotel was a clear portion of land. To ensure that no animals wandered into the path of the landing plane, someone from the hotel was posted at the strip. This hotel featured daily Land Rover safari trips into the bush. Each Jeep could hold six passengers, and if the driver passed another Jeep in transit, the drivers would exchange information as to where animals were to be found. On one occasion, a lion tried to get under our park jeep so he could take a nap in the shade. Lions made almost continuously for four days. The closest we came to seeing anything was a pair of lions sleeping after the four days. Most of the lions that we saw were asleep, since that's what they do for 20 hours a day. We also saw a number of cheetahs, 
who like to jump on the host of the groups. And this is the uh, this is the language at the landing strip in the hotel, and that's the guy who had to chase the animals off the landing strip. On our last day in the bush, the driver of our jeep decided to go off on his own rather than stick with the other jeeps from the hotel. The roads were muddy, so the jeep got stuck and wouldn't budge. When this happened in the past, another jeep would come by and throw the stuck jeep out of the rut. This time we were all alone with no means of communication next to a patch of bush that looked like a good place for lions to be hiding. The lion had to go to the bathroom, which he did in the bush with me standing guard in case any animal wanted to interfere. We were with two German couples and the guys collected boulders to put under the rear wheels of the Jeep. This didn't do any good and I finally suggested to the driver that he put the two spare tires under the stuck wheel for leverage. This did the trick and we were able to get back to the hotel. To add insult to injury, when we arrived at the hotel, we found out that all the other Jeeps got to witness a lion kill. That's a good point. We then flew back to Nairobi and stayed at the Norfolk Hotel for our last day in Kenya. Our tour operator had told us that they would take us to dinner at a restaurant that served all types of African game, but he backed out and we went on our own. We were also braver about walking around Nairobi on us than on our first visit a week before. All we wanted to get some wooden African masks and she waded into a local maze of booths until she found some masks to her liking. And checking out the masks, we brought home quite a few. When we returned to South Africa, we were met at the Johannesburg Airport by Neil and Kathy. We stayed in Ashara's apartment in Johannesburg as she was away on her honeymoon. Neely and Kathy didn't feel comfortable driving or walking in Johannesburg, so Arlen and I did sightseeing on our own. We took a, sort, a tour of Soweto, a black township, and saw where Nelson Mandela lived prior to his imprisonment. We also saw a walled compound where his former wife, Winnie, lived at the time. Part of the tour included the police impoundment lot for stolen vehicles, which averaged 100 per day. We also went to Gold Reef City where we toured a gold mine. So this is Johannesburg, the capital. One of the capitals of South Africa. They have three capitals. This is Stamtown, which is a wealthy suburb or wealthy district in Johannesburg. This is Soweto. Um, at one time it was its own uh, township, but it has since been incorporated into, into the city of Johannesburg. And there's <clears throat> a lot of blacks living at the time, at least in very primitive conditions. And during apartheid, there was a lot of trouble there. A lot of uh, rioting. And this is some of the uh, huts that they lived in. No running water, no electricity. There's a, a guy with a bucket full of water on his head. <clears throat> this is the house uh, Mandela lived in prior to his imprisonment. He went to prison in 1963, went to several prisons and was finally released in 1990 which when the president of South Africa, the clerk, started uh, coming back on the apartheid restrictions, it went on for a period of four years. In 1994, there was an election 
and Mandela was party of the ANC African National Congress won, and then Mandela became president of South Africa. Again. This is the house his former wife Winnie Mandela lived in, is right next door actually. And here you can see it's a wall compound because anybody with any uh, property had to protect it. Uh, this is Gold Reef City in Johannesburg, where the tourist attraction <clears throat> and the performances there. At the end of our stay in Africa, Neely and Kathy drove us to the Johannesburg airport. All luggage got x-rayed as we entered the airport. My suitcase went through the x-ray machine twice and I was asked to open it. I, knew, I had no clue as to what was wrong, but I soon found out. The warthog tusk from Zimbabwe was considered to be ivory, which could not be taken out of the country. After some discussion, we were allowed to take it with an official recording of passport numbers with a notation that we were taking a warthog test. And this is a picture of the offending item. It's eight inches long, mounted on a, I guess, a grass stand, which was proud, proudly displayed in all of them. Okay, I am done. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. That's a very, uh, how long did you say this trip was? 33 days. 33 days. Wow. That's yeah. pretty impressive. It's not a record for us, but at the time it was pretty long. And it was what time of the year? Well, it was December, January. So Southern Hemisphere was their summer. Oh, very nice. Anyone have any questions? I know a lot of those, uh, if you remember a picture number or a city or country that uh, Steve showed in the pictures. Would you suggest this type of a trip for 33 days for others? Well, if you want to do it right, yes. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, we, we had a great time. Yeah. Rabbi, I wouldn't suggest it. It's a very dangerous place. <laughs> To begin with, I met Nellie and Cappy in Singapore. They weren't allowed to go into Malaysia because they had an apartheid stamp on their passport. If I had had an Israeli stamp on my passport, and I had been in Israel the, like shortly before, but I had a new passport, they wouldn't have let me in either. So we, they got off the bus in Singapore. They were taken off the bus and went to the hotel, and that night we met. And that's how we became friendly in Singapore. Um, first of all, the other thing, I'll give you some corrections here. Mount Kenya Safari Club has the orphanage. There is no orphanage where he said, they do not have safari, but you can, there is an orphanage and you can put all the animals on your shoulder. It's wonderful. Um, I, when we got to Kenya the first time, we had to hire a guy with a big stick just to walk across the street, okay? The guy, as Steve said, the guy was held up in his home. When we got to Durban, two German tourists were killed in front of their kids, okay? In Johannesburg, my friends wouldn't drive during the day downtown, so we hired big African guys to take us on tour because it's scary. They had carjacked, all our friends had been carjacked in South Africa. So, and Steve didn't show the picture of where the cars were outside of Soweto in a big lot. So it's not a very safe place. I'm not saying it's, I mean, everybody wants to go on safari, go on a tour. I book them all the time, go on a nice safe tour. We had no choice to do private safaris. We got there during Christmas. That's when the wedding was, everything was booked. We couldn't get on tour. So we had to do private safaris. I wanted to stay in camps, to stay in Tanzania in camps. I stayed there because that's how you do Africa. But I advise anybody that wants to go to please go on an organized safari and I'll tell you who to go with and whatever. Don't go on your own. I, the market, what happened, the Indians ended up in Africa because they all went to work on the railroad and then they ended up staying. So they run a lot of the markets, even the market where all those masks were, 
but it, it's not safe. It is not safe. You just have to be totally careful. We had our charge card copied. Those were the days when they ran the charge card through. Well, they ran two slips. So there is, you know, they used to run the thing over the card. So it's not a safe place. And I wouldn't advise anybody to go unless you're well escorted. Sorry, but I just want Okay, to I stand corrected. Nobody should go. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said you should. Oh, okay. okay. You should not go on a ten. Uh, anyways, uh, Arlene had a little shameless plug. She is happy to book your safaris. Um, but uh, question: I know Betty or Stan, one of you unmuted your mic. You had a question, and then uh, Charlie, Charlie, we'll get to you next. Okay. Yeah, I have a question uh, on your uh, number fifty-six uh, uh, slide. There is a beetle. Yeah, dung beetle. It's whatever it is. Uh, what is it? You say, you say it's not a beetle? It's a beetle. They go around collecting elephant dung. What I said is- I what, what is the size of it? Not elephant dung. They take, it's the, those baboons. The baboons emit that dung and the beetles push it and use it. I don't know what they do with it. But actually, before Steve answers, Charlie, I think um, if Steve brings up that picture again, you'll see that it was two little beetles pushing a very large ball of dung. So, Steve, are you able to pull that back up and share your screen? But it's from baboons. The dung is from the baboons that were in the backyard of our hotel. All right. It sounds better with elephant dung. Okay. We didn't even get close enough to elephant dung. Okay, here, let's get this in the right. Okay, I'm gonna uh, enlarge it. And then share your screen again. And the ant hill was a termite hill. Um, well, I checked on uh, Wikipedia many times to see what other people called it. And they said it was an ant mound. It's, it's termites, I see them in India too. All right, whatever. Anyway, this, this ball of dung might have been six inches in diameter, and these little beetles were rolling it down the road. It was kind of interesting to watch. What they do with the dung, I don't know. Maybe maybe they build their houses out of it and live in it. That's, that's six right. inches. In, uh, that's a six inch beetle? Not the beetle, the dung. That's the oh, dung. The, the beetle oh. is one of these little critters here. There's, there's more than one, I think. You, you can hardly see the beetle. There are, looks like two or three beetles. Yeah, all right, two or three. They're like ants, they're very strong. Wow, they're pushing it? Yeah, rolling it down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't the highlight of the trip, so. I picked a nice picture to ask for a definition, for a, an explanation of, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Actually, okay. Steve, let me do something else. I'm actually, I have the high res picture of that before I shared it back for you for the PowerPoint. Right. And I'm going to zoom in so people can see it. Give me a sec. So I'll share, um, this is Steve's picture just for the, for the PowerPoint. We, we lower the resolution so it can go into the program, but I'm going to share the original picture that he shared with me. And as you can see it now, um, just a little bit more zoomed in. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. See, that, that, I think is a beetle there. And, and so you got, I see two, and they're quite small relative to whatever this is. Right. <laughs> Lots of nutrients in there for them. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, all of these pictures were taken with 35 mil slide film. It's not, so the, the quality is not as good as it would have been had I had a digital camera then. But the quality that you see in the PowerPoints are less than what the original pictures are scanned. So that's why I still have them before I deleted them. They're in my uh, downloads. And then Betty and Stan, you had a question? Um, well, the thing that I wanted to offer is that we have uh, Canadian friends who we met in Arizona and the husband is a missionary in Zambia. And he, go, he used to go every year and we took him to the airport and we said, where's your luggage? He says, it's all the books that I'm bringing to them. That's all he brought. That's all he brought. So lots of missionaries. Interesting. Yeah. Steve yeah. and Arlene, did you guys meet any missionaries? Uh, no. They, yeah. knew, they knew not to start. 
Yeah, Chabad didn't know about it yet, I guess. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's Chabad and Pretoria and all the South African cities. Yeah. I had a question. When you're out in the sticks, you yes. know, in the villages, is it, I gather they don't have indoor plumbing, but do they have things like TV or, or electricity or? No, no, no. And, and again, this was 23 years ago. Things might be a lot better now. I don't know that. And but um, Steve, a question. What year was your trip? This was in the chat. Um, it, December 1997 into to January of 1998. So 23 years ago, almost exactly. Yeah. And just to add uh, Betty and Stan, and I guess on the idea of Altria, I mean, you could go towards Page, Arizona and find some really sad looking uh, Navajo little towns. So I don't know if you have to go to Africa to find no, no yeah. television. Mm, true. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? And this is a lot of pictures. It's pretty fascinating. So how many parks did you go to? Because I noticed it seemed like you went to three or four gaming uh, the, parks. The, the, there was the Kruger National Park in South Africa. In, um, in Tanzania, it's, it's the uh, Serengeti Park. We did uh, all of Tanzania. Which, which, is, which is a good chunk of the country. And we stayed in, in two different tented camps in Tanzania, as well as the Sopa Lodge for New Year's Eve. And then we moved to Kenya and we stayed in um, three different lodges. Rabbi. One, one park in the Kenya park. Which is the Maasai Mara, yes. These, these little tented camps are $500 a night, okay? I wanted to just go to Kenya, but as a travel agent, I was told go to Tanzania because it's, it's not as, um, populated and not as touristy. Well, the roads in Tanzania go like this. So this is you, and Masai Mara backs up to Serengeti. So it's really the same animals. And I would have been just as happy in Kenya because the roads in Tanzania are terrible. But we had no choice because we did all private safaris because of the of December. But we did all of Kenya and all of Tanzania. Wow. So going back to your original question, thirty three days was probably overkill. Or if you're just looking to do a game, look, looking at animals, because we accomplished all that on the first day. But, but, but certainly a couple of weeks and, and looking at the, at the major cities would be a good trip. And Arlene will be happy to help you. Now, well, we're, su we're supposed to come back. Arlene, thank you for your comments. I appreciate them. So I'll know not to go on whatever tour you went on. No, 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 we did it privately. We did it all private. We weren't on tours. That was a problem. We couldn't hook up with them. But I want to tell you, we're supposed Thank you. to. But I also appreciate our guest today. Yeah, we're Thank supposed you very to much back. for your comments. We're supposed to go back to see Nellie and Cappy this year in December or January. But we're not going to do safaris because we've done them. Yeah, we had such a good time. We're going to revisit part of the trip. We're taking a cruise at the end of December, which ends up in South Africa. So I never expected to go back, but we, we hope, God willing, hope to do it. Oh. Any other questions? I'm going to just uh, remind everyone tomorrow is the movie discussion group. That's at 11 a.m., not at 1230. That is for the movie Nikki's Family. Yeah. And then Wednesday, we have Sit and Be Fit. And just a reminder, if you didn't see our email on Sunday, we have a trivia night that we would love for you to attend. It will be on Zoom. But it will not, you do need to register for that. It's going to be a different um, Zoom link. So we'll make sure to send that to you as soon as we have that. But uh, again, is that Jewish trivia or all kinds no, of? No, it's actually trivia that I won't know all the answers to because it's not Jewish trivia. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, it's not Jewish trivia. It's, it's done just so everyone uh, is clear. It's actually done by a, a business, I think called Q1. And um, the guy who hosts it is actually an Australian and lives in Australia. And he joins us uh, from Australia. We've done it already twice with different groups. Um, a lot of fun. He's tweaking it slightly so that you don't need to use two devices because a lot of times it's you need to use two devices. So we're going to do paper and pen instead of your phone and your Zoom just to make it a little bit more easy to uh, play.
But same questions. The questions will be just as uh, difficult as the first. But, but we can uh, cheat and look on uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, no one, no one's going to know. OK, good. Uh, thank you again, Steve. This was really great. And I know it's my Steve, pleasure. Steve has committed to do another one next month, God willing. Yes. And I think he said it will be Australia if everything goes sure. according to plan. Yes. And that was an even longer trip than 33 days. Wow. Well, thank you.